Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Nauru, an island nation in the South Pacific, declared on Monday that it was severing diplomatic ties with Taiwan and would instead recognize Beijing. The move came just two days after the Democratic Progressive Party won a third term in Taiwan recently, leaving Taiwan with 12 remaining diplomatic allies. What are the wider implications of this decision? How many such allies does Taiwan have left? And as Washington competes with Beijing for influence in the Pacific region, how do the island nations here see their role? Join us for our discussion from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining us for today's show are Professor Warwick Powell from the Queensland University of Technology and the chairman of Smart Trade Networks, newly executive director of the Research Center for Pacific Studies of Beijing Foreign Studies University, and Professor Zhong Ho Tao from the University of International Relations. Welcome to Dialogue. Uh, Warwick, you know, if you look at the uh, the factors or the reasons you know, behind the uh, di diplomatic switch. Uh, what prompted the decision of the government? Uh, is this a part of the you know, tug of war uh, for diplomatic recognition between Beijing and Taipei? In many ways, it's part of a settlement process, if you will, of Pacific Island nations finding their feet and ultimately finding their position in a world that has been changing dramatically, particularly in the last 20 years. For the best part of the last 100 years or so, Pacific Island nations have either been colonial subject nations, um, subject to European or American powers, and in the post-war period, they've been part of what the US has largely described as America's lake. As these nations have become independent, they are needing to find their own way forward. And that involves working through the challenges of global relationships, as well as pathways to peaceful economic development. And I think that this is exactly what we're seeing here. Uh, Ho Tao, uh, tell us, you know, the history, you know, between Nauru and Taiwan. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, uh, tell us, you know, what diplomatic exchanges have been, or have taken place, you know, between uh, the two regions in the past? Actually, there is a long history between Nauru and Taiwan. And just as Professor Liu said, Nauru was established, I mean, it became independent in 1968. And about 12 years later, that means in 1980, Nauru established the so-called diplomatic relationship with Taiwan. And this relationship lasted for about 22 years. That is two years after Chen Shui-bian's administration uh, taking office. Uh, that is in 2002, Nauru uh, severed its relationship with uh, Taiwan and then turned to Chinese mainland. And uh, after that, uh, Chen Shui-bian administration uh, paid a heavy price to buy Nauru. And about three years later, that is in 2005, uh, Nauru re-established its relationship with Taiwan. And this relationship lasted about 19 years. Uh, however, in these 19 years, more and more people in Nauru uh, ask or call the uh, Nauru government to sever its relationship with Taiwan uh, because more people people in uh, Nauru uh, want to uh, uh, set a good relationship with the, the Chinese mainland. Uh, well, just as you said, Ho Tao, you know, in 2003, uh, Nauru severed the relationship with Taiwan, but then, uh, you know, re-established relationship with the island in uh, two years later, basically. Uh, so there's a back and forth, at least uh, in the past. Um, are we going to see a back and forth again in the future? Um, I think it's absolutely impossible for Nauru to re-establish with uh, Taiwan because uh now, as for now, the One China principle is becoming an international consensus, and Nauru is following this trend. In this sense, it almost it is almost impossible for Nauru to go against this trend. And another reason is that uh, Nauru will benefit a lot from the relationship with uh, Chinese mainland. For example, the trade volume between the two sides, I mean, with the Chinese mainland, will increase a lot in the future. And 
the, the normal people will benefit a lot from this kind of trend. Mm -hmm. uh, another important reason is that, the, as uh, all knows, uh, Chinese mainland is a big power in the international society, and the, the Chinese mainland will help Noro in the international society. So from this, we could find that uh, a good re relationship with uh, Chinese mainland is indeed benefiting uh, Noro itself. Uh, so from the in, uh, interest of itself, I believe that Noro will keep a good relationship with the Chinese mainland. It's almost impossible for Noro to re-establish the so-called official relationship with Taiwan. Mm. Uh, Professor Daniel Lee, uh, indeed, you know, Noro's government said the move was, uh, quote, in the interest, uh, in the best interests of the country. Uh, so specifically, you know, as um, uh, Hotel mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, so what benefits uh, do you see, you know, for uh, Nauru to switch this uh, diplomatic recognition here? Yes, I think Nauru government and Nauru, uh, the president, he has uh, realized and he have seen uh, in the Pacific Island countries, other uh, 10 countries, who those uh, have a diplomatic tie with China, they have uh, most uh, benefit from, uh, uh, you know, especially those uh, benefit from uh, economic de uh, development. First, once we have uh, diplomat uh, relations, uh, they will join the, you know, Belt and Road Initiative. They will sign the in initiative, uh, the, the uh, memorandum, and they will, benefit from the project funding and, you, you know, the lot of uh, uh, project development. And second, for uh, from uh, uh, political side, they are joined as, uh, you know, the majority, uh, it's like a community in the Pacific Island countries. You know, they, they are like, uh, you know, majority countries, they are with China. And, and then um, those, uh, you know, those are left, now only left the three countries. So they are very clear, realize, you know, which side is more benefit. And, and second, uh, also they will sign, uh, you know, mutual trade agreement, free trade agreement. This will allow more, uh, you know, the product from uh, Nauru and also attract investment and trade into Nauru country. And also they have, uh, you know, based on the, you know, our large country of China, they have uh, more commu communication and exchange programs. Yeah. Mm. So there's uh, quite a lot to take into consideration. Uh, so Warwick, um, yes. you know, as Nauru, uh, is, is Nauru following the trend or the major trend of this, this region, uh, in this region, for example, more uh, the island nations in this, uh, in this part of the world uh, recognize Beijing, recognize the one China, uh, one China reality and following such a principle uh, as the international community. Absolutely. I mean, I think over the last um, 20 years or so in particular, there has been a very clear trend towards a, a lot of smaller countries that had historically um, had official relationships with Taiwan to progressively make the decision to recognise the mainland and to come on board with the United Nations consensus position. These days, um, over 180 nations recognise the Chinese mainland as the, um, as the official um, uh, government of all of China, and, um, and Nauru is following along in that path. Look, I think one of the key things to remember in this process is that Pacific Islands have, uh, have had a history of, in many ways, being neglected by the developed world. And as we go into the 21st century, they are facing many significant challenges to their own existence climate change, peaceful economic development, denuclearization of the region. These are all important challenges that need to be tackled and can't be tackled without being partnered with China, which is committed to a program of peaceful consensus-driven economic development. Okay, there's uh, obviously uh, a lot of uh, long-term uh, interest, long-term consideration uh, in such a move. Uh, 
Uh, again, if you, you know, back to the uh, island in Taiwan uh, here, uh, Ho Tao, you know, a senior official from the Taiwan side, uh, saying that, you know, said that they received a notice of uh, Nauru's plan to cut ties just before noon on Monday, basically a couple of days after the elections in the island. So um, how did the Taiwan authorities react to such a, a di diplomatic switch? Uh, and also what's uh, the public response to that? Actually, the Taiwan Authority felt very surprised about this switch, I mean, Noro's switch from uh, Taipei to Beijing, uh, because there is only several hours before the uh, of, uh, Noro's of, uh, uh, government uh, taking this kind of a decision, I mean, to show into Taiwan authorities. So from this side, uh, Taiwan authority feeling quite surprised or feeling even irritated by the uh, Noro government's uh, decision. And the second point that uh, uh, Taiwan Authority tried to blame Chinese mainland, saying that the Chinese mainland is buying Noro. Actually, this is a, a totally wrong blame because just as uh, Noro government itself said, the move was just in the best interest of the its uh, country itself, not just be, not not because of the Chinese mainland's the so-called buying. So this is the just uh, Taiwan authorities wrong blame. As for the public opinion in Taiwan, I think there are divided groups, divided opinions. The first is that um, most of the Taiwan common people feel, uh, takes no feeling about Noro. Some of them even know, uh, know uh, does, uh, do not know where is Noro, or what about the population of Noro. Uh, even some of them do not know Noro was one of the uh, the Taiwan's so-called uh, diplomatic allies. So uh, for them, they actually takes no feeling to about this kind of switch. The second uh, group is that they, uh, show, they, they, they show that this is a kind of a punishment for the DPP authority because DPP authority did, uh, do not recognize 1992 consensus, do not abandon the so-called Taiwan independence uh, Caucus, what is more, Lei Qingde won the uh, election, and they said uh, that some of the Taiwanese people said this is a kind of a punishment for the Taiwan authority. That means if Lei Qingde taking office and continue to refuse 1992 consensus, that means more Taiwan uh, diplomatic allies will sever their relationship with Taiwan. And some people in Taiwan feel this is a great disaster, a big disaster, because and these uh, people, most of them are from the so-called deep green group. For them to maintain a good relationship with the so-called diplomatic ally or diplomatic partner is a great uh, uh, a necessary move to maintain the so-called Taiwan independence. If no country maintain a, the so-called diplomatic relationship with the Taiwan, then the uh, so-called Taiwan independence is becoming no uh, possibility. So for them uh, to uh, maintain a good relationship with the uh, following 12 diplomatic partners becomes very important. So in future, they will try to maintain a good relationship, even try to buy those uh, uh, relationship with the uh, foreign 12 countries. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Ho Tao, you mentioned about this 1992 uh, consensus. And uh, as far as I know, like, uh, you know, before uh, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, say, you know, came to power in 2016, the DPP, um, there was a so-called like a freeze of diplomatic uh, war um, between the, the mainland and the Taiwan, uh, exactly because of the 1992 consensus. Uh, you know, after that, uh, since the DPP came to power over the past 10 years, you know, uh, eight years, for example, they have lost 10 so-called diplomatic allies. Tell us more about this 1992 consensus. What is it and why it is important to say cross street relationship here? 1992 consensus was a consensus reached in 1992. 
and its core connotation is that the two sides belong to one China, and there is only one China in the world, and Taiwan is a part of China. 1992 consensus is the fundamental foundation of the cross-strait relationship. And from the experience of the past 20 years, we could clearly find that if the Taiwan Authority accept 1992 consensus, then we could maintain a good, good uh, relationship between the cross strait and Taiwan could enjoy a very good international uh, space in the international society. Otherwise, if Taiwan Authority, for example, just as you said, in uh, Taiwan administration, Taiwan Authority refused to accept 1992 consensus, then uh, the cross strait relationship will meet a great challenge and the Taiwan Authority's international uh, space will be coming, uh, squeezing. Uh, so from this, we could find that the cross strait relationship, including the fundamental uh, foundation of 1992 consensus, is the basis of Taiwan international activities. Let's have a short break. We'll be back right after this. What way, if we follow this one China principle, then basically everything is fine. Otherwise, there will be, you know, uh, more or less troubles, all kinds of uh, challenges over there. Tell us more about this, uh, you know, uh, you know, international trend. We say one China principle, of course, less and less or fewer and fewer uh, countries recognize Taiwan as somehow, uh, you know, as a, as as a, a, you know, independent country. So, what does this tell us about the trend? What does it tell us about the peace and stability in this region? Yeah, look, um, the trend, of course, has been very clear historically for the last um, 30 years or more. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, the reality is, is that the shared interests of people across the entire region and on both sides of the Straits is in peaceful economic development. And the agreements that have been reached, such as the 1992 consensus, are absolutely foundational to that. They are the foundations for peaceful economic development that enables people's lives to be improved, to provide better quality education, better quality health care, more employment um, and opportunities for future generations. And that should, of course, be the focal points for everybody involved. Now, of course, not everybody actually shares those interests, particularly those who don't come from within the region itself. And they are, of course, the neocons in Washington for whom Taiwan has been part and parcel of their geostrategic and military security ambitions for the Pacific as a whole. From their perspective, stirring up trouble, creating instability is actually part of how they seek to maintain primacy within the region at the expense of peace and stability for those who actually live in the region. Well, there's a, a challenge, of, of course, you know, that's a larger picture of, um, you know, big power politics or the U.S. strategy to contain the rise of China. Uh, but if, you, if we focus on the region, uh, Professor New Lee, you know, South Pacific, uh, you know, we do see there's also kind of competition. At least we see, you know, competition from Washington to see, oh, there's increased Chinese presence in the, in the region. You know, tell us what, what's the Chinese policy? toward the you know uh, south pacific and also nations in the region um, i think the competition uh bring to pacific island region uh, is uh, uh happened recent years but china into uh, pacific uh, region it's uh from uh, uh, 1970s, uh, while those countries are uh, getting more and more independent, then China uh, uh, set up the diploma, uh, diplomacy relation with those countries. But recent years, um, you know, some countries, in order to, um, you know, to to make the uh, geography political in in this uh, in this region to bring uh, to um, how to say to give uh, 
great pressure to China. But we can see uh, China, sometimes we say, uh, you, you come in, we are here. You don't come, we are still here. So we are here not for the purpose for uh, have any competition with any other countries, just for the good relationship with those countries. And, and in fact, uh, we are as a, a, a bigger country, you know, we give a lot of help. Uh, to those uh, countries. And from countries uh, them, uh, itself, they also need uh, help from, uh, not from uh, Western country, they also from, you know, different uh, societies, different organizations and different countries. Okay, so, so, so Warwick, this is really about, you know, from economic independence, let's say, you know, political independence and now economic independence, they are, say, getting more and more truly independent in terms of being a sovereign nation. Yeah, look, economic independence, of course, is absolutely foundational to sustainable political sovereignty. And the long history of the region has seen these nations largely subjected to the whims of colonial powers for a long time these nations have been dependent upon aid grants from major powers, which have not contributed to sustainable, independent economic development. And this has to change. This has to change because the region as a whole faces significant challenges brought about largely by climate change and its impact that is having on the future of many of these island nations insofar as their existence itself is concerned, but also in the case of Nauru, for instance, how it transitions from an economy that historically was dependent upon a single natural resource, the phosphates, which are no longer economic to mine, to developing a viable economy based on other natural attributes. And these are the things that I think we need to bring a collective wisdom to address. And this means drawing on the economic development experiences of China, as well as a model of governance that is focused on building consensus, as opposed to using grants and aid money as a way of exercising influence. Mm -hmm. uh, so lastly, Warwick, you know, how do Pacific Island nations you know, look at this uh, um, you know, the presence of the big powers, the US, Australia and China, how do they look at this kind of uh, competition, you know, like it or not? Is there any way, you know, what are they are trying to do, say, to benefit from maybe if there's a positive competition uh, among the big powers here? Look, in some ways you could describe the attitude as being one of hedging, where independent nations are taking advantage of the opportunities to um, gain more attention from major economies and major powers. At the same time, though, I think we've got to be mindful that Pacific Island nations also insist on not being put in a position where they are having to, quote, choose sides, unquote. And this really goes to ways of thinking about international collaboration and economic and social collaboration models that are either based on the idea of rivalry as the organizing principle or based on the idea of consensus as a way of bringing disparate perspectives together to find those common ground positions so that we can anchor a pathway forward that is less about tension and division and more about being able to solve practical problems and i think the attitude that pacific island nations bring through their cultural history of consensus making is really well suited to this new 21st century model of cross-national and cross-civilization consensus building consensus building well, on that note, we come to the end for today's discussion. And many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu See you next time.